Uh, well, so welcome to Q, uh, programming as a, as a tool of thought. Uh, it's me, the one who is speaking today, but uh, uh, this talk was in collaboration with Juan Manuel Serrano, which is, uh, who is here in the, in the room. And uh, well, today I have one objective, just one objective. The objective is that I want to encourage you to learn a new language. Okay? So, for example, uh, why I want to, why is this important? Because uh, learning a new language makes you a better programmer. Uh, it improves your, your memory, your critical thinking, thinking skills, your problem solving skills. It also improves your concentration and many other things. So, for example, we could learn Portuguese, uh, or why not? We could also learn Arabic. So, which option is, is better? As science suggests, the harder the language, the higher the level of cognitive benefits that, that you get. Okay? So, uh, I speak Spanish, so the Portuguese version is not uh, very difficult to, to understand. We can easily translate it to, to, uh, to Hello World. But I have problems with the, with the Arabic counterpart. Okay, why? Because uh, the alphabet is weird. Uh, besides, it is also read from, from right to, to left. So, this version probably is best if I want to improve my, my programming skills. But okay, uh, probably we won't have the, we don't have the time to, to learn a, a new language. I still have to, to improve my, my English. And besides, this is uh, the Lambda World Meetup. This is the, the home planet of, of Lambda Man. So, we are going to narrow down the list of possible candidates to functional programming languages. Okay, so which language is uh, analogous to, to Arabic? What about this one? Who knows uh, which language is, is this? It's APL. Any programmer of APL in the, in the room? No? Okay. So this is the solution to a problem that we are going to see later on. But uh, you can see that there are very weird symbols. The, the operators are, are strange. And also, uh, this language is read from right to left, uh, the same as Arabic. So today, uh, we are not going to, to learn APL, but we are going to learn Q from KX systems. Uh, Q is a descendant of, of APL, a modern descendant. It is commonly used in, in high-frequency trading. It's also used in domains like, like Formula One. And, and well, this language uh, doesn't have the, the weird alphabet uh, from, from APL, but it has the same underlying uh, design patterns. Okay? So, so today, uh, I'm going to redefine uh, my objective. I want, you, I want to encourage you to learn Q. So, how can I do it? I think that the, the best motivation is to show you my, my own experience while, while learning this, this language. Okay, so first of all, a little bit about me. Um, my name is Jesus. Uh, I have a PhD in computer science in, in functional programming, and I've been part of the Abla computing team since the very beginning of the company. I think that more than 12 years uh, now. Uh, well, we are a small team of uh, functional programmers uh, and data engineers and uh, mainly in Scala and Spark, but we also learn very crazy things like, like Q. Okay? So Oscar, Christian, uh, Paco, who are, who are there, they are also joining this adventure of, of learning this, this language. So this is my, my first contact with, uh, with Q, was uh, I think that two years ago, more or less, uh, Javier Sabio, which, hold, which is the, the head of advanced analytics and, and trading algorithm, uh, he asked us if we could speak Arabic. I mean, if we could program in, in Q. And we had no idea at all at that moment, but we said, okay, we are going to, to give it a try. So we started uh, learning it, and here you can see the hello world. Okay, clearly, the hello world part is easy. The, the stream part is easy. But the print, this, you have a zero, a capital N, you have an exclamation mark, so this is not very similar to, to a print, right? We don't have the print line or something, something similar. 
this seems like a, a like a very different language. So uh, at first sight, I thought that this language was uh, honestly. I thought that it, it was a joke. Uh, it was a uh, it was aiming concision at any cost by removing every single white space from the from the expressions, and also it overloads. Uh, the question mark, the exclamation mark, the, the dollar sign, it has many different semantics which are very different from, from one another. So I said, okay, this is, not, this is not for me. Also, it was dynamic, dynamic type. So not my cup of tea. So, uh, so uh, we, I have a change of mind because today I'm, I am here trying to convince you to, to learn this language. And I think that there are two major turning points that make me uh, have a new perspective on, on Q. The first of all was learning that Q is actually built on very strong uh, foundations. It is, uh, okay, here we can see the, the notation as a tool of thought. This is a, a paper from, from Kenneth Iverson, which was honored with the Turing Award in 1979. And I started to feel that this language was actually very, very smart, that the notation, the, the symbols, uh, was, uh, it was a very good design with very good design uh, patterns behind. So I started to think, hey, maybe here we have something interesting. And the other turning point was uh, like six months ago, I started working at BBVA, uh, in a project with, uh, with Sabio, with uh, Alejandro Varela, Miguel, uh, Carlos, and also with the KX team, with Alfonso, with uh, Jorge, with Manuel. So now I think I have a, I could go deeper in the language and now I have a, a better perspective. So I, today I will try to show this new perspective to, to you. So perhaps you, you want to, to learn this, this thing. So what is the, what is the outline? Okay. I'm going to, I was thinking, uh, on, I was thinking on showing features of the language and then showing examples, but at the end we thought that maybe it would be a better idea to guide the, the talk by, by examples. So here we have four examples, the four problems. The first of all is a, is a factorial. This is just to, to warm up. And then we have three problems that I have taken from the APL problem solving competition. But don't worry, they are going to be very, very easy problems. So, uh, and for each problem, we are going to, we have four steps. First of all, I'm going to, to describe the problem. Then we are going to see a conceptual solution of, of this problem. Then I'm going to show the, the Q implementation, where we are going to see that uh, it's pretty connected to the, to the conceptual solution from the, from the previous point. And finally, I'm going to show the, the Scala implementation. The objective is not to compare Scala with, uh, with Q, but the, the objective is more uh, in the line of using Scala as a vehicle to show the underlying patterns that are in, in Q. Okay? So, First of all, uh, a small disclaimer, I think that, of course, uh, Q is, a, is an array language, but it's also, I think that the killer feature of this language is uh, KDB+, Plus, KDB+, Plus, uh, which is a high-frequency column-oriented database, which is really, really, really fast. And the language also has tables, has a special notation to, to deal with, uh, to make queries. It has uh, very expressive joins, the, the as of joins. It has inter-process communications and many other things that make them uh, reasons on their own to encourage you to, to learn this, this language. But we are going to be out of the scope of this talk because today we are going to focus on the array uh, part. Okay, so first problem. Okay, first problem is just the, the factorial. You know what is the, the factorial. It's uh, getting the product of four positive integers from one to a given number. Okay. So the conceptual solution is quite easy. For example, what? Sorry. If we have the factorial of five, we get uh, 120. Okay. So the conceptual solution, uh, first we start with this uh, five number, then we get all the numbers from one to, to five, one, two, three, four, five. The next step is to, to place the multiply operator in the middle, and then we simply, uh, uh, we follow the structure, we evaluate this, this expression, 2 times 3 is 6, 6 times 4, 4 is 24, and then we end up with the 120. Okay, so the conceptual solution is quite easy. 
So we are going now to, to a Jupyter Notebook, and we are going to see the implementation of, the, of this factorial in, in Q. Okay? Um, okay, so this is the first problem. This is the factorial. Uh, this is a Jupyter Notebook, and we can evaluate this 5. We get a 5. Uh, and now we are going to show several things to get to this uh, factorial implementation. So first of all, we need to, to, make a, to implement a function. So the first step is to, is to create a function. What is the way to create a function in, in Q? Okay, we can use something like, like this. This is the, the, the identity function, is the function that takes an argument and returns it as is. Okay, so we get this 5, and we get that this function, uh, it takes the 5 and it returns the, the 5. Okay, this is uh, something, something easy. Q has something interesting, and um, when you... Uh, okay, so in brackets, we have the parameters, and the, this part of here, this is the, the body of the, of the function, okay? So, this has something special, because uh, you can get rid of the parameters, and if the name of the parameter is x, we can simply leave it uh, this way. So, we have this x, and this x is the, uh, the identity function. We apply it to 5, this is the argument, so we get the the five okay is it <laughs> perfect so so now we need to generate the the natural numbers from one to to five so the next step is using the primitive till that gets something similar uh, it doesn't start by one it starts by by zero so we have zero one two three or four the problem is that we, we need to remove the zero because otherwise we are going to multiply these elements and we are going to, to get a zero as a result. Okay? So we need a literal tweak here. And we are going to start to see now this is, a, is going to be our first contact with the array paradigm because we can do something crazy like this. Okay, we get one, which is a scalar, and we are summing it, we are adding with a list. On the, on the left hand we have a scalar, on the right uh, hand we have a, a, a list, okay? So the result is that for each, element, for each element of the list, we apply, we increment it by, by one unit, okay? So, next step is to, uh, to reduce, to apply the multiplication. Uh, well, if, you are, if we have functional programmers, uh, we program in a scalar, we already know the default, the default left, for right, this family of catamorphisms. So we can do something similar. We have the over iterator. The over iterator is very similar to the to the fall in, in Scala. And we can do something like this. We apply it. What well, the over iterator uh, takes three arguments. The first of all is the list. The second of them is the the binary operator, and the third is the uh, the zero element, the base case. Okay, the thing that we are going to return, for example, if we, we pass uh, an empty list, an ill list. Okay? So, we apply this, and things are starting to, to get complicated, because uh, we have this operator, we don't know the, the precedence of, of them, it is not perhaps clear uh, where to start reading this, this, this expression, and before this, we need to know something. For example, What is the result of, sorry. What do you think is the result of this operation? Five multiplied by nine. Five multiplied by nine. Why? <coughs> okay, perfect. The precedence is always to the, to the right. The operator, no operator has precedence over another. Always we have to read from right to the, to the left. Okay, so here it happens something similar. We start generating the, the elements from 1 to 5, then we sum one unit, and then we apply the, the, the fold. Okay? So, there is another thing that we can do to improve this version, is that we can get rid of this one, and if we put this into parentheses, uh, it assumes that the zero element associated to this binary operator is 1. So, we can do something like this, and we get also the 120. Okay? So, finally, we have the factorial, so we simply assign it to a name. Okay, this is the way of assigning vari variables and, and functions. And we can do this invocation, which uh, was the original one. So we get the factorial function, and we get that factor factorial of 5 is uh, 120, and factorial of 4, for example, is 
24. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, so now we are going to see that uh, the conceptual simulation, the conceptual solution, is not very far from the from the code that we that we have just uh, created. So first of all, we have this till five. We get the zero, one, two, three, four. Then we sum the units. We get one, two, three, four, five, and then we simply apply the the, the multiplication over all the, the elements. One times two times three times four. So the only difference here is that uh, in Q we consume from right to left. Remember. So first of all we we multiply four four times five. Uh, then we have uh, three times twenty, uh, two times six, three, and finally we get the one hundred and twenty. Okay. So so now it's time to to make a comparison between the the Scala version and the and the Q version. Okay, the first line is the is the Q the Q version. We have this factorial. Uh, we have this idea, and in the second line we have the the Scala counterpart, where we can see we have an until. Okay, the until is very similar to to the till. It takes a, another argument as the starting point. Uh, then at the right we have this fold. Okay, the, the fold is uh, very similar to the over iterator. Do the base case is the one, and then we pass the 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 multiplication uh, operation as a, using the placeholder notation. But the most important thing here is this map. Why is this important? Because uh, in the original version from, from Q, uh, we are uh, summing a scalar with a, with a list. So in, in a scalar, we need to do, we need to do the, this, uh, this lifting uh, manually. So we have, we have to use a map to apply this function one plus something to each of the elements of the of the list. So the takeaway here is that if you are familiar with category theory, uh, at the end the notation of uh, of this factorial in Q is very connected to the to functors. It's very connected to a to a container and to something that can be mapped over. Okay, so. Let's go to the to the next problem. This is the attack of the of the mutations. Don't worry, it's going to be this is easy as well. So this is the description of the of the problem. Uh, it takes uh, two arguments, two strings. Uh, we simply have to identify the the Hamming distance. I mean, the we have to put the both arguments together, and we have to identify which elements are different from one list to to another. So here we have A B C D E F G. And here, uh, the second argument, the y argument, is a, b, x, d, y, f, g. So we have, this is different, the c and the x is different, the e and the y also is different, so the result of this uh, mood function should be 2. Okay, this is clear? Uh, the conceptual solution is also kind of trivial. Okay? We put one string, we put the other uh, right uh, below, and we simply apply the uh, distinct function to identify if they are the same or they are different. In this case, the c and the x are different, the e and the y also are different. So we get that the third and the fifth position, uh, we get a one, we get uh, a true, we get something that identifies that uh, in this position we have something different. Okay. So now we can simply get uh, filter these elements, filter these true values, and we can count them. So we get that the Hamming distance in this case is is two. Okay. So let's go back to to the Jupyter notebook. And here uh, we have another. We have this section for this problem. But first of all, we are going to start with a with a different thing. Uh, now we need two arguments, the x and the y. We need two two strings. So we need to know how to get two parameters instead of just one. We can do something like this. We use the same operator, the the, the add from from the previous uh, problem, and now we have we can do something like this. Um, well, we can sum the x and the y, and the the result of summing three and four is seven. So what is this function here? Okay, we get the the parameters. So this is the body of the function, and then we have to to pass the arguments. Uh, if you remember from the previous point, for example, the Identity function uh, was defined something like this. So the notation changed. It, this also works here. 
but when we have two arguments, we have to do something like, like this. So this is the first version. We simply sum three and four, but also as in the previous case, if we have, if the names of the first and the second parameters are X and Y, we can get rid of the bracket se section. Okay. So now we need to, to grasp a, a little bit about list. Uh, so a list in Q is something like this. Okay. This is the shortest uh, syntax that you can get to, to, define, to define a list of numbers. And we are going to, know, to do something different here. We are going, instead of passing scalars, we are going to pass a pair of lists. Um, 456. What do you think is the result of this invocation? Got it? Okay. So we get five, seven, and nine. We add one and four, we add two and five, and finally we add three and six. So the very same operator that we can use to sum scalars and the very same operator that we can use to, to sum a scalar with a list is also valid to sum a list with a list. So as long as they have the very same length, we can do something like this and we uh, apply this function uh, pairwise. Okay, so back to the problem, back to the to the Hamming distance. Uh, perhaps it's important to say that in, in Q, uh, the string the string type uh, doesn't exist. You have a list of, of charts, so we can understand this uh, really like uh, like uh, a list with uh, several with several charts. Okay, so we can pass them to this function. We are going to apply instead of the sum. We are going to apply the this thing operator, and we are going to pass as first argument this thing, and the second argument is going to be uh, this one. So we execute this code, and we get uh, a Boolean vector where the positions uh, which are different are identified with a with a true value. Okay, the third and the fifth positions. The C with the X and the E with the Y are different, so they are identified uh, this way. So now the next thing that we can do is simply to get uh, those positions. We can use the where to count the number of, of positions that uh, are true. By using where, we get a list of the elements which are true in this Boolean vector. And finally, we simply count here and we get the the two okay we count where the elements are are different okay this is very intuitive in fact we can go a little bit farther because uh, approaching that uh, well taking advantage that this language is uh, dynamic and we can simply use this sum we sum the elements where x is different from y uh, despite that the x are different from y uh, returns a boolean vector uh, since this is dynamic, it uh, translates the one into into true. Oh, sorry, the other way. It uh, translates a true into one and a false into zero. So if we sum the the, the things that are different, so we get the, the the two. So finally, we have this function. We assign it a name. We are going to call it uh, one. Okay, so we have the solution to, to the second problem. Uh, we have to count where x is different from, from y. Okay, this is very, very natural. So what about the, the version of, of Scala? Okay, again, we are comparing here, and the first line is the, we see the, the, the Q counterpart, and the second block, the second snippet is the, the Scala one. And the first thing that we can see is that uh, here we have strings, a string is a, is a type, uh, a native type in, in Scala, so we have to uh, translate it, we have to adapt it into a, a list of, of charts. Uh, so this is just a, uh, the, the adaptation, okay, this is not uh, very important. Also in the two last lines, we find the filter, the filter with the identity, the filter is very similar to the word, and the length is, uh, of course, similar to the, to the count. But the meat and the potatoes here is in the map and, uh, in the map and expression, okay? 
Uh, why? Because this mapping uh, is not a method from, from Scala, it's a method that we can find in, in Scala Z or in CATS in this case, and this is a special syntax for applicative founders. In this particular case, is the int instance is the most prominent instance of the least applicative founder. The, this instance put two, two lists together and it applies uh, the function pairwise. So also, not only with functors, we have a connection with applicative uh, functors. So if you, are, if you are familiar with them, uh, it's easy to identify that this is just a, a convenient notation to deal with this kind of, of things. Okay. So, third problem, in the long one, okay, this is going to be more, more difficult to, to show, it's very easy, but the conceptual solution is going to be a little bit weird. Uh, so, uh, okay, I used the, I forgot. Uh, so, the description is, we have to write a function that takes uh, a list, uh, which is a Boolean vector, and then it returns the length of the longest sequence of consecutive ones. So here in this case, we see, we see that uh, here there are three ones, then one, two, and finally we have four consecutive uh, ones. Okay, so the result is four because uh, here we have uh, four consecutive ones. So the conceptual solution, okay, we start with this, with this vector, then we identify the, the ones somehow, and the thing, the the most uh, challenging thing here is identifying the different groups that that we have for for these ones okay so we have the the index one the index two uh, the i sub three the index four as well and the objective uh, what would be something very nice is to replace each of these ones by the index of the group that it belongs to okay so we want something like this. Uh, we want this uh, 20, 25. We remove the zeros and we uh, replace the ones to the group, to the index of the group that they belong to. Once we have this, it's very easy because we can group by value and we simply have to count the, the value. We, we simply have to count the, the group which has more elements in, in it. In this case, four. Okay, so the problem is how can we identify uh, this group for this identifier for each of the of the groups. So my idea here was to do the following. Uh, we start with the with the vector. We use the the index of the of each element, and we get the indexes of the elements uh, what are which are true. Okay. So this means we get the zero, one, two. We discard the three and the four, but we get the five, we get the seven, eight, etc. So we end up with this vector. Okay. So now. Uh, the trick is that if we re-index this again, if we place a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 for each of these elements, and we subtract the, the, the positions from below with the indexes, we get an identifier uh, which is unique for each of the, of the groups. So, for example, from 0, 1, and 2, we get the identifier 0. From 10, 11, 12, 13, we get the identifier 4. So, once we have this vector, it's very easy because we just have to, to group we group by this value, and we can see that the fourth, uh, the fourth group, the the last one, is the uh, has four elements in it. So this is the, the the maximum. Okay, it's more or less clear. Okay. Then we go back to to Jupiter. If you see the b at the end, it means that this is a, a Boolean vector. So the ones and the zeros represent uh, true and false. So okay. So let's go to start here. So we already know that the, we can use where to identify the positions where the Boolean vector is, is true. We can do something like this. So we get that 0, 1, 2, 5, 7, etc. are the positions where the, the, the vector is true. So the other thing that we can do the other thing that we have to do, sorry, is to place the um, uh, the index. We have to re-index again the the, um, the result of these uh, positions. So we can do this trick. Okay, this is not uh, very important implementation, but we can see that we have paired the positions 0, 1, 2, 5, 7, 10, 11, 12, 13 with just an index 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. Okay, so now 
we can use the positions and we have we can subtract it to the indexes. So with this trick, we get the unique identifiers for each of the of the groups. Okay, so the rest of things are pretty easy. First of all, we need to uh, to group. Once we group, we get uh, something weird. This is a, a dictionary. Uh, a dictionary is like a map in in a Scala, and we see that the the index zero uh, are in the positions zero, one, and two. The index two is in the third position. The three is in the fourth and the fifth. So uh, we have the, this list. The positions here are not important because we want to count the number of elements in, in each group. So to do that, we simply apply the count each. Okay, this is this each is like the, the map because we don't want to count the elements in the dictionary. We want to count the elements in each list, in each value of the of the dictionary. So with this we get uh, the number of elements in each group, and finally we can calculate the max, so we get the four. Okay? So, final step. Yeah, previously I used the wrong name. Here is a one. So, yes. we can assign it to, to one, and we simply calculate this. So, it's four. If we uh, increase the number of ones, we get a different number. Okay? So, back to the code. <coughs> oh, uh, this is the Scala counterpart. Okay, the Scala counterpart is uh, now longer than perhaps expected. Uh, the implementation in Q is quite natural. You sum, you calculate the, these positions, and you simply group, count, and calculate the, the max. But here in Scala, uh, we have to suffer a little bit more to implement this, uh, this version. Why? Okay, because, well, we can see first that the group is, uh, is trivial. We have here a group by. It's not exactly the same, but it's uh, quite similar. We have the map size, which corresponds with the count each. Okay, this is our, at the end, this is the, the same. The, the each represents the, the map. And finally, we have the, the max. But the problem is here in the where and in the subtraction of the, of the indexes. So what is going on? What, what's the problem? The problem is that the Scala doesn't have a where. Uh, operator. Why? Because in Scala, when we are working with lists, we are not thinking of positions. Uh, it's weird to think in positions when we are in this in this context. So we have to use the zip with index. Then we have to collect uh, these cases. Then we have to reindex again with the zip with index, and then we finally we do this uh, subtraction, which, which corresponds to to this thing. So the takeaway here, at least for me is that uh, when I go back to Scala, sometimes I already started to miss uh, operators from, from Q. Okay? So, final problem. This is the pyramid scheme. So, first of all, write a monadic function. A monadic function. Okay, this is uh, something that, that... This is not a closely. Okay, a monadic function in, in Q just, uh, is just a function that takes one argument. Okay? So... No monads here, no, no effect, so this is important to know. Uh, well, uh, the description is that this function takes an argument, m, which is an integer, and then, for example, if this integer is 3, we, have, we are going to create a pyramid which is seen from the outer space, okay, from the top. Uh, the 3 is in the middle, the 3 is surrounded by a, uh, by a wall of 2s, and then we have another level which is surrounded by, by 1s. Okay, the problem is clear. Okay, so this is more tricky. Okay, this is something more more complicated. Uh, so first of all, the conceptual solution: uh, we have the three. We know how to count from from one to to three, but first of all, we need to calculate the width of this of this matrix. What is the width of this matrix? Okay, the width is uh, multiplying the input element by two and then subtracting one unit. Okay, we have to get till five. Okay, so uh, this is the width and the height is exactly the same. So we have now the, the structure of, of this matrix, is the, of this matrix. It's a matrix of five uh, columns and five rows. Okay, so 
we could place in the relative positions in the in the cells we could place the the position that uh, this cell corresponds to so for example we have here one 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 two one three and the thing goes on until we have five four and five five okay so now we could do we could calculate the minimum of each of these value we could do something like this we could calculate the mean of each of these pairs and we are going to get very close to the to the solution we have the ones here we have the twos the three but this part is broken okay so we are close but we need to make a little bit uh, uh, tuned here in order to to have it uh, behaving properly so what is the trick the trick is that instead of uh, generating the position from one to five we are going to do this trick which is getting one two three to one so this solution uh, is not uh, my own uh, the credit goes to to this forum of the discussion of these of these problems but i found it it was very clever so i i like it to to use it here so once we have the one two three to one here we have the same one two three to one we can calculate the minimums and we get exactly what we want okay this is very tricky but this is a, a really nice uh, idea so we are going to, to implement it now so let's go to the final problem we start with the argument which is a three so we start with this three uh, as usual we need a function we are going to we already know that uh, this gets the all the elements from one to three okay so um, this gets all the elements from from one to three and now what we want is to calculate first of all the one two three to one so we can use reverse to to inverse this this list okay we have the three to one but now we want to concatenate it with the one two three so we can copy this part we put it here remember we have to use parentheses because otherwise uh, the precedence is, is broken this x is going to to be linked to, to the result of this reverse and well once once we have this in parentheses we just have to concatenate the one two three with the three two one and we get this value here we have two problems the first of all is that the solution is wrong okay the output is not correct and the other one is that we have one plus till x then we have the very same thing uh, here so this is kind of uh, ugly so we are going to do something which is uh, interesting in this language is that we can assign a result to a variable in the nowhere in the middle of the expression we can say okay assign this value this part to to v and we can later maybe we are going to to reuse it later so we do this and we get the one two three three two one but look at this this is very weird especially if you don't know that you have to read this from right to left because we st you start <coughs> reading this expression you see the v and what the hell is this is this v okay this is defined this is assigned in the in the right uh, in the right part so now next uh, task to do okay we have to remove one of these trees uh, from the middle so we can use the drop operator we have also a drop in in a scala so we get the one two three two one here so we are uh, getting closer to, to the solution okay <laughs> it's uh, hard to to see the the pyramid right now but we are not uh, that far so next thing is to calculate the cartesian product to get uh, all the positions uh, all the combinations of one two three two one with itself so for that reason we are going to assign this result to another variable and we are going to do the cartesian product which is cross uh, which is the operator cross between one two three two one and again one two three two one so we apply this function and we get the cartesian product with one 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 two one three one two one one okay so uh, still we are close from from the matrix so but first of all uh, before getting there we are going to calculate the mean of each of these of these values so we use the mean mean each because we have a list of lists and we want to enter uh, a dimension so we apply this mean and we have finally all the elements of the of the matrix you don't know it but here 
we have the the pyramid okay so next step is to get this uh, get the get the matrix so we know that this is a five by five so we can use the take operator to get the the solution okay you say i want a matrix of five rows and five five columns or, or otherwise i don't or vice versa i don't know uh, the problem is that we have hard code the the five so this really is in the five what we want here is to calculate the the length of the of one two three two one which is <laughs> count uh, w we count w again and as in the previous case wait you can see that here we are repeating code we don't like to to repeat code so we are going to use another trick another variant of the of the take operator that we can use this which is this one we can take for example two fives it gets a list of five and five so we are going to apply this technique here and we are going to get the count of w twice so finally we have our implementation we are going to assign this to to the peer function <clears throat> And if we execute this, we get the peer three. But for example, if we do a peer of nine, we get this complex uh, thing. Okay? So this is a complex calculation. And we have implemented it with just one line. Okay? So this is very cool. So let's go back to, to the code. We are going to compare this with the, with the Scala counterpart. Uh, nothing interesting here but okay we can see that the we don't have this uh, idea of assigning a, a variable in the middle we could simulate somehow it with higher order functions i remember that there was a f sharp notation with, which was popular several years ago which is similar to to this idea but uh, okay the other thing that i miss here perhaps is the the cross the the cartesian product i am using a for comprehension to to calculate it and the end of the rest of things is just uh, calculating the the size and making some adjustments which are needed to to calculate the list of of list which is different from the from the value in, in peer but as well the code uh, seems a little bit uh, longer and remember this is a scala okay this is not python this is not another programming language a scala is quite concise and the code that we are getting here for q is really 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 short okay if I guess that if you implement this in Python, it's going to to get uh, way far longer. Okay, so we have implemented all the problems. So we are going to to conclude. the The first conclusion is that uh, Q feels like Arabic at first sight, but I think that the major barrier is the is the syntax, is the notation. But once you get used to it, the underlying design patterns are very natural and they are very intuitive at least in my in my view so the other conclusion is that uh, if you are if you have a previous knowledge of functional programming it's very useful why because it not only paves the way through the functional parts for example for with iterators which are higher order functions or with the data structures uh, we are very good we functional programmers are very good with with lists with this kind of of structures but this also helps with the array paradigm ones because if we know that uh, the syntax is like the syntax of summing and a scalar with a with a list is similar to a functor, and we already know that the the that summing two lists is similar to the applicative functor, we have a lot of things. Uh, we we know a lot of things before entering this uh, this language. So another thing that I've uh, noticed is that when I go back home, when I program in a scalar. Uh, I have started to miss these, these patterns and operators. For example, the cross, the assigning of a variable in the middle, uh, the where operator. So this is a very good sign because it means that something has changed in my, in my mind and now I have a different perspective to deal with uh, array problems. Uh, okay, so this leads to the title of the talk, which is the uh, programming as a, as a tool of thought. Uh, I think that uh, the more perspective that we have of one problem uh, the better the vision that, that we get and here the notation of the of the notation of q uh, is an abstraction that that let me be very precise 
at the time of uh, implementing these, uh, these complex uh, problems. So this notation is actually very good. It frees your mind and you can focus on the, on the problem. Okay. So next steps, uh, as I said before, Q goes beyond array processing. It's a highly demanded uh, profile. I think that it's very interesting to, to learn it. Maybe you are thinking of a, of a change in your career. Uh, I think that Q is also a smooth transition towards uh, APL. I remember in the past when I was learning Scala, uh, Scala was for me like a bridge to, to Haskell. And it goes in both directions. Because if you know Scala, uh, if you learn Haskell, you are going to, to become a better Scala, Scala programmer. So I feel that this uh, symbiosis is uh, also uh, prevalent here. Because I think that Q is something like that learning APL uh, could be very helpful uh, to, to learn the, the patterns and the, and the notation that we can find on, in Q. And finally, if do you think that Q is not for you, this is perfectly fine. But I would be very happy if after this talk, uh, you go to your, to your house and you think, okay, I'm going to start uh, to learn a different, a different language. And you know, the harder, the better. So some references. Uh, First of all, the KX Academy, they have excellent uh, courses here uh, to, to learn Q. Uh, then we have Q Tips and Q for Mortals. They are two books that complement very well each other. The first of them is more practical. The second of them is more a uh, reference manual. So uh, I recommend uh, reading both if you are interested in this technology. Uh, if you want to go in the dark side, in the academic uh, side or on a more theoretical variant, uh, you can read the notation as a tool of thought, the, the paper that I saw uh, before, and also the applicative programming with uh, Napoleon functors from Jeremy Gibbons. In fact, this paper was presented at Lambda World uh, several years ago. It was the closing keynote, and it's really, really interesting because uh, it uses Haskell to provide uh, a static typing implementation of, of APL. But in the paper, it shows many connections, uh, like the Functor 1, like the Applicative Functor 1, and there are many others. So this paper is, uh, is, is brilliant. I, I really like it. Uh, then we have the Learning APL. This is, I, I've started to learn APL recently, so this is uh, the book that I am following. So far, it's uh, pretty good. Then we have the, the ArrayCast. It's a podcast of uh, Array programming languages. And finally, uh, this is the Don't Teach Coding book, which is a book that is a general book to which supplies a different way of understanding programming, a different way of learning programming, and you can find very interesting things about the cognitive benefits of, of learning languages. So I have two donkeys. Uh, this is Lambda. Uh, the other one is Paris. So Lambda has to be at the Lambda World Meetup. So finally, thanks to, to the Lambda World organizers and co-organizers for for inviting me, thanks to Raul Vázquez who is recording the talk, uh, thanks to Celonis for this fantastic host, takes team, uh, baby we are, um, thank you all for your attention, so now I think I'm ready to, to answer questions, if any. That's all. Thank you.